Welcome, a very, very warm welcome to all of you, whether you're gathering with us here in person or from some place in the city um, around the world. We are glad you're here. I'm Reverend Beth Hayward, um, minister of this congregation, and I'm so delighted to be able to welcome you to this very important Remembrance Day service. We gather here on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and we honor the land wherever we are gathering this day. You'll notice that I'm wearing a beaded poppy today. This is a, a symbol of Aboriginal veterans. November 8th is Aboriginal Veterans Day. And you'll notice throughout the service today that we will focus on our windows, on our books of remembrance. There is also behind me a kit uh, from a grandfather who served in World War I. So I'll give you a little more of the history of our church and why this day is so important a little later on. Um, one more piece of introduction is to our guest speaker today, Seth Klein. Seth was the uh, founding director of the Center for Policy Alternatives and worked there for 22 years. He's the author of a newly released book, A Good War, um, talking about the climate emergency and how we can mobilize for that. And so delighted to have Seth with us today and his spouse, Chris Boyle, who's known uh, to many in the congregation as a former minister on staff here. However you come, wherever you are, this is a day to honor and remember those who have worked for the cause of peace in our world, from our country, and also a day to dream deeply, boldly, about what a way forward looks like in our world, being a people of peace and vision. Welcome. We light a candle for peace as we do each and every week. We name this the Christ candle in this place. But really, there is no other word to describe that presence of Christ in our midst than peace, which is expressed in loving acts and kindness and gentleness to one another. And so this light, as you light your candle at home, as we light it in the space, remembering that light goes a long way and your light contributes to this world. We've invited today some children to share their reflections on peace. These kids are part of the Burrard Street Story Guild. It's a ministry of this congregation. They gather on Friday evenings each and every week, and they learn stories of scripture. They learn stories uh, that will carry them throughout their lives and work with those stories so that they might become part of themselves. Um, so I just, uh, this video speaks 
for itself, and you will see all of the things you might expect when you ask children, what do you think of when you hear the word peace? Listen in. Peace to me is probably love and family. Peace is to me is relaxing. I think peace probably means a time when there is no wars or like conflicts. To me, peace means taking care of others and being kind. Peace means to me is cats being cute. Peace is like quietness. Yeah. Peace is when everything is okay and no fighting. Peace to me is when people don't get in war and when it's very quiet in the room. To me, peace is when there's no war. Peace is when there's no conflict in the world. Peace means everyone's happiness without damaging other people. Peace is when we have an actual good president ruling over the United States and not someone who claims climate change isn't real. Peace is when nobody hates each other. Peace is when everyone's happy. To me, when I think of peace, the first thought that comes to mind is church.
Don't you love the variety we can do with music around here? <laughs> one, of, um, one of the soloists, the one back here to my left, uh, was saying before service that that song is chewy. All those words in it. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> um, but it is good to get our bodies and our mouths and our minds and our hearts working today. I want to share with you some announcements. And just before that, for, for those who are new in our midst, a bit of our story. Because if, if you get to be part of this community, you're told this story again and again. It's, it's the story of this church that everyone who's part of it learns by heart and wants to tell to those who come through our doors. Not only is this a beautiful space, this building came to be, the idea of Canadian Memorial came out of World War I. One Reverend Colonel Fallis, a padre, came back from the war and um, after burying so many troops, he made this promise that he would build this testament to peace, this chapel uh, that would intend to embody uh, that sense of peace, that all would be welcome come here, um, religious lines and race, and, and none of that would matter. And so um, in 1928, uh, our first service was held here on Remembrance Day, exactly 10 years after the 1918 armistice, and uh, we celebrate our 92nd anniversary. If you have the privilege of coming into this space, you'll see the windows have been donated by each province in Canada, representing uh, biblical stories and stories of our colonial history. You'll also see that we have the only other uh, source of the Books of Remembrance outside the Peace Tower in Ottawa, which is a pretty special gift that we, um, that we steward in this place, enlisting all of the war dead uh, from both World Wars and the Korean War. With that history, I'll move into today and share some of the light and excitement that's happening around here. Each year around this time, we offer a special opportunity for you to give to the mission and the work of this congregation that we might continue to be an open-hearted, open-minded, affirming community and live into that. It's called Light Up the Season. More information will be coming over the next few weeks, but you can go online and donate a light for our mass of tree in front of our Center for Peace building. Uh, each light will represent uh, someone that you are honoring or remembering in this season. So really encourage you to consider giving to that fundraiser uh, for our mission and ministry this year. Also save the date. We are nearly at the middle of November. So there will be Advent and Christmas services this year. We'll speak more about those in the weeks to come. Um, and depending on provincial protocols, uh, we'll let you know if you can join us in the sanctuary or not at this point um, we are continuing with our sign up to be present in the building following physical distancing and masking protocols um, and that is I think that's all I have to do just a reminder that Seth Klein is our guest speaker he'll be up here in a little bit and I'll hand it over um, to Lonnie you can donate online anytime there's a link there on the YouTube channel and also sign up for our newsletter over to you along with our musicians who are here faithfully almost every weekend today joining us on trumpet is Malcolm Aiken who uh, joins us for almost special every special occasion we have so thanks for being with us once again Malcolm it's great to have you here and uh, yeah sure let's give him a big hand um, and then following at the end of the ceremonial uh, remembrance portion that we will do, um, you will hear a virtual choir video of the Kane Memorial Choir singing um, Love Shall Be Our Token. And I mention that because I just wanted to say thank you so much to all the choir people. It's a lot of work to do that. So a special thanks to everyone that um, did that, to Hannes and to Jay Esplana uh, for their editing work and um, just very grateful for the choir that we have that is still working hard to uh, minister to you, all of you, whether here or beyond, and just very grateful and I'm really proud of you. I just want to let you know that. And now we will move into our um, ceremonial portion, as I mentioned, of our remembrance service. The war years were ones I spent in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and there were many stories that I could tell you, but one of my favorites is this one. 
My father was the minister at Fort Massey United Church there, and on Sunday evenings, after the service, people, all the service personnel that were there, plus the parishioners, would be invited to stay for coffee. So there were many there this one particular evening. And they were stood, they were asked to stand up and give their names. And at that time, they were not allowed to say what ship they had been on or what contingent they were in. So they started out by standing up and giving us their name. And then when they came to this man at the other end of the hall from me, he stood up and said, my name is Mac McConaughey and I was torpedoed off South America last month. And a man very close to me stood up in a hurry and said, we rescued you people. And of course, there was dead silence for a moment until people realized what he had said. It was one of those memorable stories that I will never forget. It made an impression on all of us. Well, I wasn't alive during the Second World War, of course, but uh, my story is about uh, my parents, actually. Uh, my father was a Canadian soldier who went to Britain um, waiting for the invasion in June of 1944, and during the breaks he went up to Scotland and met my mother. He came home, or they got married, he came home in a troop ship, and she came home on a similar ship a few months later, known as a bride ship. She was one of 20,000 Canadian war brides. So one of the things that came out of the war experience was a mixing of people who would never otherwise have met. There was a similar uh, large contingent of people who came from the Vietnam War. And those uh, similar 20,000 people uh, added to Canadian culture in many different ways. An earlier one was when the Mennonites came as an escape from the War of the Bolsheviks uh, after the Russian Revolution. Again, a people that contributed a lot to Canadian society. Currently, we have the Syrians escaping the war in Syria, and I'm sure they too will contribute enormously to Canadian culture. Not only did the war uh, bring people to Canada that would never otherwise have come here, but wars also led to those people send, making a difference in their home countries as they sent home letters and emails and money to uh, have an effect on the cultures and countries in which they left. So although a war is a terrible thing, uh, one small benefit that we can think of is this mixing of people that otherwise would never meet, making improvements in both the countries where they arrive and the countries that they have left. And to uh, read the names of those who have fallen during wars in our time and to recognize and honor National Aboriginal Veterans Day, I'll indicate who of those were Indigenous people. From World War I, Private Clifford Alexander Aberdeen, Seaforth Highlanders, aged 21. He was one of 11,000 names found on the Vimy Memorial. Private Percy Charles Chatfield, Canadian Infantry, age 20. Private George Walter Fitch, Canadian Infantry, D Company, 54th Battalion, age 34. Private Richard Back, Canadian Infantry, Quebec, 42nd Battalion, age 21. He was an Indigenous soldier. From World War II, Private James Edward Grinder, Seaforth Highlanders, age 22, also indigenous soldier. Pilot officer Charles Francis Hart, RCAF, 7th Squadron, age 30. Private Jacob Shelby Brandt, Army, Lincoln and Wellington Regiment, age 19. He was an indigenous soldier. Troop Sergeant Major 
Robert Canton, Army, Fort Gary Horse, age 26. From the Korean War, Private John Joseph Bishop, Army, Royal Canadian Regiment, age 19. He was awarded the Korea Medal and the UN Service Medal. From Afghanistan, Private Richard Anthony Green, Army, Princess Patricia, Canadian Light Infantry, 3rd Battalion, age 21. He received the Sacrifice Medal because he was killed during friendly fire. And finally, back to World War I, Private Alexander de Coteau, Canadian Infantry, Alberta, 49th Battalion, age 29. He was an Indigenous soldier. Good morning. The last name that Russ read out, Alexander de Coteau, was an indigenous soldier. And because it is National Aboriginal Day today, I'd like to tell you more about this exceptional young indigenous man. Did you know that on November 12, 2017, Canadians participated in the Alex de Coteau Run, a 5K portion of the 16K Poppies Run which took place through the battlefield at Passchendaele in Belgium. But who was Alex de Coteau? Alexander Woutony de Coteau was born on November 19, 1887, on the Red Pheasant Reserve, located in what is now the province of Saskatchewan. Alex's father died when he was four, and his mother had no way of supporting her five children. So they sent them to, he, they, she sent them to Battleford Industrial School, a residential school. It was there at the school that Alex discovered he had a special gift and a talent for long distance running. And that was a passion that he pursued for the rest of his life. Alex moved to Edmonton for work. And in 1911, when he joined the Edmonton police force, he became the first indigenous police officer in Canada. He carried on his training and carried on in, uh, competing in athletic events, and he was selected to be on the Canadian team to represent us in the 1912 Summer Olympic Games. Two years later, World War I started. Alex joined the Canadian Army in 1916 and was sent to Europe in 1917. Again, while stationed in Europe, he never stopped competing, he never stopped training. There's a wonderful story about uh, him having won a five-mile race in Salisbury, England. King George V, the King of England, was presiding at this event. And when it came time to present Alex with the first place trophy, they couldn't find it. So King George presented Alex with his own personal gold pocket watch. You can imagine that Alex treasured that watch and carried it with him everywhere, even onto the battlefield. In October 1917, Alex and his Canadian comrades were sent to Belgium to take part in the final push to capture Passchendaele. At the end of the day, on October 30th, the Canadians had indeed reached the outskirts of Passchendaele, but 30,000 had died, and Alex was one of them. His body was found on the battlefield. There is a story told by his niece that the German sniper who shot and killed Alex took his pocket watch. And then, two days later, that German sniper was killed, the pocket watch found and returned to Alex's mother. Alex de Coteau is buried in the new British cemetery alongside 649 other fallen Canadian soldiers. All these accomplishments went largely unnoticed until the mid-60s when an Edmonton police officer found an old newspaper clipping 
and started doing research on this extraordinary young indigenous man. Since then, Alex has received many honors. He is now inducted into the Edmonton Sports Hall of Fame. He is inducted into the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame. In 1985, there was a special Cree ceremony to bring his spirit home from the battlefield. In 2014, a city park was established in Edmonton in his honor. And in 2015, he was inducted into the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. This extraordinary young man was killed before his 30th birthday.
in Flanders 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 the poppy is blown is blown is blown is blown between the crosses crosses row on row row on row row on row row on row they mark our place and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly fly scarce heard a the guns below 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 scarce heard a misheard a misheard a misheard the guns below 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 we are the dead are the dead are the dead short days ago Scripture reading today begins by telling us that Isaiah saw a word. The word he saw is in part carved into a wall across from the United Nations building today. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. As we listen to these words, living as we do in a time of global uncertainty, an invitation to consider that Isaiah is not a naive idealist. He is not a Pollyanna prophet. This vision of weapons of war turned into agricultural tools, images of death dealing turned into food producing, is a promise for the days to come. But biblical visions in both testaments come to us from the future, longing to shape the days in which we are living. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, friends, and uh, let me start by saying what an honor it is to have been invited to give your Remembrance Day sermon here on these unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and at the end of this very emotionally charged week. I have uh, I've attended many Remembrance Day services uh, in this church with this congregation in recent years since my wife joined the ministry team some years ago. And I love them, and I've sung the praises of these services to others. Like many of you, I suspect, I have long harbored ambivalent feelings about Remembrance Day, wanting to honor the sacrifices made 
but uncomfortable sometimes with the glorification of war. And into that breach, this congregation steps, and you really nail it. You own that ambiguity, you embrace it, and you allow us to remember authentically and to recommit to peace. And given your stellar record in this regard, I must tell you that this invitation was an, uh, an intimidating prospect. And moreover, in typical United Church fashion, you have asked a secular Jew who cut their political teeth in the peace and disarmament movement of the 1980s to share Remembrance Day thoughts in this place built by a First World War vet. And uh, why not, eh? It's just so very Canadian Memorial of you. So as many of you know, I, uh, I published a book a couple months ago, and to the surprise of many, not least myself, uh, I've written a war story. The book, it's titled A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency, is about the climate crisis, and it calls on us to adopt an entirely new and different approach to the crisis than the one that we have pursued to date. Its original twist is that, as the title suggests, the entire book is structured around lessons from the Second World War. Now, as I've already alluded to, there's no small irony in me coming to this place. And like many of you, I'm sure, I too wrestle with the war analogy. Not only did my political activism start in the peace movement, I, I am the child of Vietnam War resistors. That is, in fact, how I happen to be Canadian. But I am now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society, galvanize our politics, and to fundamentally remake our economy. My book project began as an exploration of how we can align our politics and economy in Canada with what the science says we must urgently do to address the climate emergency, and it, it is that. I had initially planned, however, to include only a single chapter on lessons from the Second World War because I'd, I'd long been intrigued by World War II as an example of rapid economic transformation. But as I delved into that work, I began to see more and more parallels between our wartime experience and the current crisis, and ultimately decided to structure the whole book around lessons from Canada's World War II experience. Again, not because I get all animated about war, but rather it is because I see in the history of our wartime experience a helpful and indeed hopeful reminder that we have done this before. We have mobilized in common cause across society to confront an existential threat, and in doing so, we have retooled our entire economy twice in the space of a few short years. The book explores what wartime scale mobilization could actually mean and look like. Each chapter jumps back and forth in time between stories of what Canada did in the war and what we now face. And in these comparisons, it answers questions like, how has public opinion rallied to support mobilization during the war? How could it be galvanized again? How is social solidarity secured across class, race, gender, and region? Can we do that again? How did we collectively marshal all of our resources to produce what was needed? Can we do that again? How did we pay for this transformation? And can we mobilize the necessary finances once again? What supports did we offer for returning soldiers? And is there a model there for just transition for fossil fuel workers today? What was the role of indigenous people in the war, something we of course mark on this day in particular. And what is, what is that leadership in today's transformation? Importantly, what are the war's cautionary tales? The warnings of things that brought us shame, the internments, the squashing of civil rights, the poisoning of indigenous lands, and perhaps most apt to the current crisis, the response to refugees, those things we do not wish to repeat. And running through it all, what sort of political leadership do we require to see us through challenges like this? And I'll start with one important comparison I make because it gives me some hope and it is this, which is that despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it is worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders were reluctant to recognize what would ultimately be necessary. A lot like today. Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience, yet right up to the 11th hour, the government and most of the public still hope to avoid getting dragged into that fight. And so we find ourselves today in a similar awkward period 
where the summer before last, the federal government passed a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons one day and then proceeded with re-approving uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline the very next day. That is the new climate denialism at play. But as with the Second World War, I'm convinced that this phony war period will not last, that it is in fact about to end. It's my view that we need a new wartime scale approach for three reasons. First, because both World War II and the climate crisis represent profound existential threats to our security and well-being and civilization. If we fail to rise to today's climate emergency challenge, the human, ecological, and economic costs will be devastating. The science is now absolutely clear that if we do not act quickly, then over the course of the rest of this century, things start to get horrific. A world that is unlivable and catastrophic for many, deeply disruptive for all others and quite possibly ungovernable. Second, we need a new approach because what we have been doing in response to the climate crisis thus far is simply not working. If you look at Canada's greenhouse gas emissions going back the last 20 years, what you see is a flat line, meaning emissions are no longer climbing, but neither are they in decline. Despite decades of calls to action, our emissions are simply not on a path to stave off that horrific future for our children and future generations. We have run out the clock with distracting debates about incremental changes, but where it matters most, actual GHG emissions, we have accomplished precious little. Nature does not care if our emissions are no longer climbing. As the great climate change warrior Bill McKibben has said, and in fact I think I heard him, him say it in this very sanctuary a couple years ago, winning slowly on climate change is just another way of losing. Politics, as they say, may all be about compromise and the art of the possible, but there is no bargaining with the laws of nature. And nature is now telling us something fierce. But third, and this is the key message of my book, we need a new wartime approach because when we adopt an emergency mindset, amazing accomplishments become possible. We've all witnessed this in recent months. Something powerful happens when we approach a crisis by naming the emergency. It creates a new sense of shared purpose, renewed unity across Canada's confederation. It liberates a level of political and economic activity that seemed previously impossible. During World War II, starting from a base of virtually nothing, the Canadian economy and its labor force pumped out a volume of military equipment that is simply mind-blowing. During those six years, Canada, with a population less than a third what it is today, produced 800,000 military vehicles more than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined. 16,000 military aircraft ultimately producing the fourth largest air force in the world. And here in our province, where we seem unable to build a single BC ferry anymore. We produced about 350 ships, again, from a base of virtually nothing. Just pause here for a moment to reflect on the speed and scale of these accomplishments, because so often when talking with each other about climate, one hears the refrain, you know, but Canada's a small country. What would it matter if Canada were to act on climate, especially if the U.S. is going in the opposite direction, which it was until yesterday, mercifully. But putting aside for a moment that Canada's per capita GHG emissions are among the highest in the world, and we are the sixth largest oil producer and fourth largest gas producer in the world, but put that aside for a moment, because one of the things that so inspires me about our Second World War story is that we didn't wait on the Americans. We threw ourselves into the fight two years earlier. Indeed, for much of that time, we were the only country in the Western Hemisphere engaged in the war. And we were an even smaller country then. And when it was over, no one questioned the value and importance of our contributions. Emergencies and disasters can bring out the worst in us, but they can also bring out our best. We've all seen and experienced this in the pandemic. And the worthiest kind of leadership, whether at the grassroots or community level or the big P political level, seeks to animate our best selves. American philosopher William James published his famous essay, The Moral Equivalent of War, in 1910. He had just lived through the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and he was active in anti-war circles opposing the Spanish-American War. But while opposed to such wars, 
James understood that people need the sense of meaning, purpose, and common struggle that come with war. Watching how people responded so well to the San Francisco earthquake provided James with evidence that in the face of disaster, people often behave magnificently, not only overcoming fear, but also caring for one another. James sought examples of events or struggles that could, quote, inflame the civic temper as past history has inflamed the military temper. To which this climate emergency moment replies, look no further. On this Remembrance Day, I'd like to share stories about two vets that are in my book. The first, and it's an apt one on this Indigenous Veterans Day, drives home what I see as a key lesson from World War II for the climate emergency, namely that Indigenous leadership and title and rights is central to winning. One morning, as, as I was writing last year, a news item came across the radio about the death of Louis Levi Oaks, the last of the Mohawk Code Talkers from the community of Akwesasne. M much like it had been important to Canada to independently declare war from Britain in 1939, interestingly, the Iroquois Confederacy, of which the Mohawk are members, also independently declared war on Germany, which resulted in many Mohawk men enlisting. Oakes died at the age of 94. The code talkers were indigenous soldiers tasked with using their own languages to communicate secret military information among the Allies forces. In news reports after Oakes' death, his daughter revealed that astonishingly, Oakes hadn't told his family what he did during the war for seven decades having been sworn to secrecy only in his late 80s when stories of the code talkers were made more public did he finally reveal what he had done and then he got a congressional medal silver medal and followed by special honors from the assembly of first nations and the canadian house of commons oaks was one of 17 code talkers from aquasasne but there were hundreds of others from indigenous nations across north america as the war was unfolding the secret codes employed by the allies kept getting broken by the nazis and the japanese but then the U.S. Marines discovered that enemy forces were unable to crack Navajo. And they ultimately recruited indigenous soldiers from 33 indigenous languages, language groups, uh, who were deployed to various branches of the Allied forces, including a number from indigenous nations in Canada, such as Mohawk, Cree, Tlingit, Ojibwe. But as I learned of this, it struck me that there is in this piece of wartime history a tragic irony. Our two countries have spent generations trying to erase these languages from the earth, literally beating them out of children in residential schools, only to uncover that these languages were the unbreakable code. That's what they were dubbed in the war, credited with having been vital to victory in certain battles, particularly in the Pacific. And then if we fast forward to today, the same can be said about indigenous rights and title, which similarly our two countries have spent generations systematically abusing and violating. And yet as our mainstream politics dithers and dodges on meaningful and coherent climate action over and over and over again, it is the assertion of indigenous rights and title that is coming to our rescue, buying us time, slowing and blocking new fossil fuel projects until our larger politics comes into compliance with what the science says we have to do. My second story is about a man named C.G. Gift Gifford. Those who served overseas during the Second World War came back forever changed, and some drew lessons from their war exper experience that motivated them to fight for peace and human survival for the rest of their lives. They never stopped doing what they could to secure our collective future. When I was a teenage peace activist in the 1980s, I had the great fortune of getting to meet some of these people, including Gift Gifford a lovely man and co-founder and longtime chair of Veterans Against Nuclear Arms, or VANA. Gifford was raised in a pacifist household. But as he watched the rise of fascism as a young man in the 1930s, he became, became convinced that Hitler had to be stopped. He joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1941, became a navigator, flew 49 bombing raids, and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. One of his last raids was the bombing of the German city of Dresden. On the night of February 13th, 1945, as the war was nearing its end, over 1,000 bombers flew across the English Channel. 
and dropped as many as 200,000 bombs on that historic city, causing a firestorm that killed 25,000 people. The necessity of the operation has long been a source of controversy, and Gifford recalls that he and his fellow flyers didn't feel good about the mission even before they left. They, they doubted the city's military value. When I got to meet Gifford in the late 1980s, he still looked dashing. But I'd seen him before in a wonderful NFB documentary called Return to Dresden. The, the film follows Gifford on a trip back to the city in 1985, where he attended events marking the 40th anniversary of the bombing. In one scene, which I can still remember watching in awe as a teenager, Gifford is mobbed by dozens of city residents once he's identified as a veteran turned peace activist who was part of the bombing mission. It's a very emotional moment, and, but Gifford remains remarkably calm as he listens and talks with this crush of people who lived through the destruction. Tell him about the firestorm, one older woman asked the translator. Tell him three of our sons lie here under the rubble, asks another. Tell him thank you for coming here and that he should fight for peace together with us, another request. Gifford and a handful of other vets founded Vanna in Halifax in 1982 when the Cold War and nuclear arms race were in full swing and then US President Ronald Reagan talked about fighting and winning a limited nuclear war. Alarmed by such talk and fearing for our future, it wasn't long before Vanna chapters had sprung up in cities across Canada and grew to 800,000, excuse me, 800 members most of them Second World War vets. They would attend peace marches and Remembrance Day ceremonies wearing white berets to symbolize both their past in the military and their desire for peace. I, I think they may also have been the originators of these white poppies, but I, I could be wrong. After the war, Gifford became a social worker and then a professor. He died in 1993. Those Vanna vets are no longer with us. as we now face down the climate emergency. But if they were, I have no doubt that they would be with us in this fight, marching with the student climate strikers. They laid the way, uh, taking lessons from the Second World War to confront global crises in the present. Like many of you, as I read the latest scientific warnings, I'm afraid. In particular, I feel deep anxiety about the state of the world we are leaving our kids and those who will live throughout most of this century and beyond. All of us who take seriously these scientific realities wrestle with despair. That is the ambiguous time in which we live. The truth is we don't know if we will win this fight, if we will do what we have to do in time. But consider this. In the Second World War, from a population of a little over 11 million Canadians at the time, over one million Canadians enlisted. It's remarkable, isn't it? Yet it is worth appreciating that those who rallied in the face of fascism 80 years ago likewise didn't know if they would win. We often forget that there was a good chunk of the war's early years during which the outcome was far from certain. We know how that story ended. They did not. Yet that generation rallied regardless and in the process surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving. That is the spirit we need today. We all need to sound the climate alarm however we can. Now is the time to demand from both our federal and provincial governments that they adopt true climate emergency plans and an audacious Green New Deal. We can and should do so knowing from both our wartime experience and now our pandemic experience that when we adopt an emergency mindset, the speed and scale of what we are capable of accomplishing is spectacular. So let us commit this Remembrance Day to take action on this task of our lives. Few of you listening today were alive in World War II, but those of you who choose to mark Remembrance Day have an appreciation for this history. You watch films and you read books about pivotal times like those we rem remember today and when you do, there is, I suspect, a question in your head, and it is this. What would I have done if I had lived then and there? But today, as the future of our children is cast into doubt, and as another civilizational threat arrives at our doorstep, 
The answer to that question is really no great mystery. The answer to that question, friends, is whatever we're ready to do now. Thank you. Peace be with you. So much gratitude for for those voices and uh, and it is such a gift to see the faces of our choir thank you and words of gratitude as well for Seth Klein for your words today from the heart um, your words of challenge and inspiration you know there's people who say that uh, faith and politics don't mix and I'm I'm not one of them <laughs> And uh, you, like me, may well have been um, glued to your television this week uh, or, or your phone or whatever the case may be. We care deeply about what happens in the world. It's a matter of faith. 
It's a, a matter of faith to show up in our lives with eyes wide open and continually hearing that call to who am I called to be? What is my action in my life and my communities and this world? And so a word of thanks for Seth uh, to lay out the facts and the call and an invitation to all of us uh, to let that settle in and hear how it lands in your life of faith. Who will you be? In, on this Remembrance Day, who will you be at this moment in our common life? And so one of the things we do as a people of faith, we pray together. We pray together to hold up those in our lives, in our world who are hurting, to give thanks for the blessings that are surrounding us moment by moment. And so I invite you to join your hearts together with me as we pray. O oh, spirit of life, we yearn for a world free of injustice and oppression. We yearn for a world free of vengeance and violence. For a world where the small gifts of kindness and respect are planted and watered to mature into mighty trees of peace and justice. Our hearts ache this day for the victims of war and oppression, of abuse and neglect, and the systems and everyday apathy that allow hurt to manifest in these ways. May we trust the call to be a people of healing love, a people who trust our part to play in bringing comfort and healing to minds and spirits broken by violence. When the injustice of the world seems too much for us to handle, May we know hope that what we have to offer will be enough. And when fear of the power and opinions of others tempt us not to speak, not to speak up for the least amongst us, may we know courage to risk following a way of peace. And when we feel ourselves fill with anger at those who are violent or oppressive, may we be a people of compassion when we tell our stories that we have given all we can to peace in the world. May we know courage and patience, serenity and self-honesty and gentleness of spirit. We offer these prayers in equal measure with the heartfelt prayers for those we love, for neighbor, stranger, and earth as we speak together the words that Jesus taught. Pray with me. Eternal Spirit, Father and Mother of us all, holy is your name. Let justice and mercy fill all creation and let us recognize that every thought and thing belongs to you. Feed us with the bread we need for today Forgive our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Stand with us in trial and temptation. Free us from the gift of all that is evil. For you alone are creating our universe now and forever. Amen. I'd also like to say thank you to Stephen Tanner who wrote the song in Flanders fields that we heard as the leaf wreaths were being laid. And I'm hoping that he will give us permission to post that song on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll let you know, and I'm sure he will. So uh, it's beautiful, and I know that you'll want to hear it again. I invite you to sing this new song with us as you get to know it.
So much gratitude for being together. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to join the virtual coffee hour, uh, the link is there. If you'd like your own copy of Seth Klein's book, we've added a link to his website on the YouTube channel. Friends, remember, remember this day that you hold within you the power to show up in your life, in this world, an instrument of peace, one who dedicates their life moment by moment to stepping into the best self you can be. Imagine what can be possible if we allow our dreams to be big enough. Go into this day, be peace, live peace, fight for peace. And go knowing that you are accompanied by God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen.